Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, EC590. And our speaker today is uh, Andrew Stilwell. Uh, he's working with Professor Hilawa. And today, Andrew is talking about a bidirectional DC DC converter for hybrid electric transportation. Hi, thank you. All right, uh, so we'll go through this. I'm not going to take the full hour. I believe I'm the only presentation today. Um, so don't worry, we're not going to be here the whole time. Uh, let's get started. OK, so first we're going to talk a little bit about hybrid electric vehicles and what I'm considering high voltage for my application. Uh, we'll talk about some of the power switching devices needed for that and why the flying capacitor multi-level uh, alleviates some of the issues there. We'll talk about the number of levels needed for this and why I'm uh, approaching my particular design and then go into some hardware results and, and talk about some interesting kind of changes and features that come out of this sort of design. So when I'm looking at high voltage applications, I am kind of targeting in on, on two different areas. One is hybrid electric vehicles. And believe it or not, that minivan up there is in fact a hybrid electric vehicle. Uh, it's the Chrysler Pacifica. It's actually a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Uh, so think of it similar to a Chevy Volt. Uh, it can go on its own battery for about 30 miles uh, and is at the point where, you know, we're at the point with hybrid electric vehicles that we now have hybrid electric minivans, not just the Teslas or the Bolts or anything else along those lines. But when you look at hybrid electric vehicles, uh, a pretty common architecture with them is to have their battery voltage in the order of 100 to 200 volts, uh, potentially higher, and then they step that up to a bus voltage, uh, again, ranging from 600 volts, maybe up to 800 volts. Uh, and that's what actually they use to drive the motor. And in that case, you need this bi-directional DC to DC boost converter, shown here, that allows you to step up and step down. And it needs to be bi-directional because we're not only driving the motor, but we're doing regenerative braking and those type of aspects. Now, at the same time, uh, if we look at the solar industry, uh, one of the trends that's starting to become more popular is when you get to larger installations, they're looking at 1.5 kV solar. So they'll have enough panels in series that they get up to 1.5 kV. Then they'll step that down to 480 volt uh, AC. And uh, this is a solution from GE. It's an e-house solution. And it's basically the size of a uh, container, uh, like a cargo container, to give you an idea. Uh, this is like a, a megawatt or multi-megawatt installation. But the idea is, for a lot of our designs, these are actually very similar type of underlying structures for us. We can build power converters that not only allow us to do this bi-directional DC to DC, but eventually when we get up to 1.5 kV for solar, uh, we can use a lot of the same underlying technologies and a lot of the same uh, circuitry that we've built for previous applications. So most of what I'll be working with is looking at the hybrid electric vehicles, but everything's within mind to get to solar eventually where we'll need that 1.5 kV bus to work with. So if you look at switching devices for this kind of voltage range, right now there's, there's two main options. And this is assuming you're using a typical H-bridge type of, uh, of converter or, or a buck, com, buck or boost converter. In those cases, you're looking at switches that need to be able to handle a kilovolt or 1.5 kilovolts. And in that case, you're mostly looking at IGBTs and silicon carbide. Uh, now, silicon carbide will continue to push out in higher voltages. Um, but IGBTs really make up a lot of this. Tesla lists that they specifically use IGBTs in their electric vehicles. Uh, silicon carbide, especially in the solar industry, is really making some headway there as well. But when you look at, say, other options, GAN or superjunction MOSFETs, they're, they're not quite there yet. The bulk of GAN uh, is either pretty lower voltage with, say, the EPC devices and the 60 volts up to, say, 300 volts or there are a lot of them at 650 volts, which is typically for telecom applications at, say, 400 volt uh, DC buses. Uh, there are starting to be a few uh, devices out there at 1,200 volts. Uh, there's some smaller companies that are advertising that as preliminary samples, but you're not seeing a lot of volume up there at 1,200 volts. And same thing with superjunction MOSFETs. You're seeing some of those up at 900 volts. And the idea is we'd like to be able to use GAN. Uh, when you look at kind of the fundamental figure of merit for GAN, it's very attractive when you compare it, compare it to silicon carbide or silicon devices. For the same breakdown voltage, you can get much better RDS on. Now, we're not there at those limits yet. We're, you know, depending on whether you're talking to a GAN supplier or a silicon carbide supplier, they'll tell you how close or how far away we are on those. But we got to assume it's going to keep growing there. And GAN uh, is very successful at the 650 volt range. So it's an attractive point to try to use those switches. So 
our solution for this is to look at flying capacitor multi-level converters. Um, basically, this allows us to use these 650 volt GAN devices in these type of applications. So just a, a brief overview of flying capacitor multi-levels. I believe we've seen these a, a bit before. But basically, you've got flying capacitors. This is showing a four level. Uh, you've got two capacitors. And basically, they step down this, uh, the voltage and spread out your voltage uh, across your different switches. So this capacitor is at 2 thirds VN. This one's at 1 third VN. Um, the switches act in complementary pairs. And you can kind of think of it like a buck when you're looking at the step down operation. In the end, you get a switching node that is filtered by your inductor and actually has the same transfer function. V out is equal to DVN. So very similar operation. You do get some benefits, though. So one, the voltage stress across your switches is divided by N minus 1. So the more levels, the more you reduce the stress of your switches. Uh, and this is compared to, say, a buck, where the, well, the stress would be, say, Vn. Uh, and this allows you to use smaller switches. So when you have smaller switches, they have less parasitic capacitors, capacitance. You can switch them faster. When you can switch them faster, you can reduce the size of your passive components. So this allows us to increase our density. At the same time, the inductor ripple is reduced by 1 over n squared, or n minus 1 squared. So you can reduce the size of your inductor. And then finally, kind of a side benefit when it comes to thermals, instead of having two main switches where you're really, uh, I'll say abusing, but you're, you're, all the power is going through those two main switches and all your losses are focused on those two switches, now you're spreading this out across your multiple switches. And hopefully at a much lower power usage as well, because again, you've got a lower voltage, you're going to have some lower losses there, you can use devices with lower RDS on. So, we talked a little bit about levels. More levels allows you to decrease your uh, switch rating, but at the same time, you know how many is, is too much? Uh, so if you look at some previous designs, uh, there, here are three examples, and these happen to be three examples from the University of Illinois. But all of them are working with one kilovolt uh, voltages. And if you look at this, if you look at the number of levels, this was a 13 level design, the second one was a nine level design, and this final one was actually a step up, it was a seven level design. And all of these handled roughly a kilovolt, uh, either on the input or the output. And you can see, basically, their approach was to use lower voltage switches. So they use either 100 volt switches or 200 volt switches. Uh, these were readily available from EPC. They're good switches. All of these are good designs. But if you extend this out, if I want to now use this type of design on a 1.5 kilovolt design, we're getting to a lot more levels. Uh, so that's 19 levels, 13 levels, 10 levels. And with each one of these levels, you're adding ad additional flying capacitors. You're adding additional gate drive circuitry, uh, more complexity on your PWMs and everything else along those lines. You're still getting the benefits. You're dividing down your voltage across your switches, but you're getting a lot more circuitry in there. And actually, the mass and dense or size of your capacitors starts overwhelming your inductor size. So you kind of have a very unbalanced design at a certain point. So this approach is to look at a four-level flying capacitor multi-level, and we're going to use 650-volt GAN devices. Uh, the specific ones we're using are from GAN systems. Uh, they're readily available on the market. They're used a lot in telecom-type applications. Uh, good devices. And once you start going to 1.5 kVs, uh, now you have a switch stress of 500 volts across each switch. So still within the switching uh, stress limit of this particular switch. And when we're operating at, say, 1,000 volts, it's 333 volts uh, of voltage stress. So again, well within a safety range. And again, we're using four devices. Uh, sorry, four levels. So we're talking six switches total, uh, six gate drivers, two flying capacitors, uh, much less complex. But again, higher voltage stress across those few switches. So let's look at the experimental prototype real quick. Again, this is a four level, and this is the schematic. In order to drive this, uh, one of the challenges you'll find is, driving the, uh, is providing power to the gate drivers. A lot of the gate drivers out there, especially if you're looking for a high side, uh, low side solution, are only rated for, say, 100 volts between the high side and low side. And we're looking at 300 to 500 volts per, uh, between the high side and low side. So you have to drive and power each gate individually. In this case, we used a cascaded bootstrap structure uh, that basically allows us to, to piggyback off of each capacitor and charge the higher voltage capacitor from, a, uh, from the next one down. One thing to note is each one of those diodes, so these, also has to be rated to the same rating that our uh, switch stress is. 
So if we're at 1500 volts, these also have to be 500 volt rated diodes. Um, but again, this allows us to power all of them uh, from a single source. We're not using isolated power supplies uh, as we have in other solutions. It ends up being a pretty compact solution. When you look at the, you know, a few of the notable features here, you can see our input capacitance. Again, we just have the two flying capacitors and each one of these black boxes is the gallium nitride switch. So going into some results, one of the big things that always comes up with flying capacitor multi-levels is balancing. Uh, in a typical waveform, you, and looking at the switch node, you want each one of the peaks of this pulse train to be at the same amplitude. If they're at a different amplitude, it means your capacitors are not balanced. They're not at the expected voltage. Uh, and so in this case, you can see this is showing uh, the results at one kilovolt input, stepping down to, if I remember right, yeah, six to one step down, a kilowatt output. You can see each one of these peaks is roughly at the same level at 333 volts. So that shows very good balancing. If we weren't balanced, we would see kind of uneven peaks. One would be higher than the other. Uh, at the same time, you can see our output, 166, and you know, our current, you get a little bit of noise on it, uh, but we're, we're right there at about six amps. And just to show, this is bi-directional uh, operation. It's a little bit hard to see, but basically this current is now negative where before it was positive. So we can see we're doing a 100 volt to 500 volt step up. It's reverse direction. We're only doing this at a, about a 500 volt operation, uh, but we're, we're able to provide that same backwards, forwards, charging from whichever direction we need to. So let's look at some efficiency real quick. So again, we're looking at a, a few different operation modes. The peak efficiency is up there around 96.6%. Uh, to give you some context, that's pretty reasonable. If you look at some of our completely optimized designs, the nine level design, for example, had a target of 99% efficiency, and it's pretty close, if not right at 99% efficiency at its peak. Uh, one of the nice things at this is even at 1.5 kilowatts, we're still at about 96% efficiency. Uh, and then the power density, again, if we're looking at just the power stage uh, and looking at the volume of that, uh, the power density is 475 watts per inches cube, which is a pretty good place to be right now. Now, one of the things that's interesting out of this is you'll notice a couple of these stop here, and even though my efficiency is relatively flat here, I stopped taking measurements. And the reason is I started running into thermal limitations. So anytime you're, you're running these, a lot of, you know, you'll be monitoring temperatures, and the gallium nitride switches start getting hotter and hotter. That's where the bulk of my losses are in this particular design. And one of the limitations I ran into was, was they're getting up there around 100 degrees C, uh, they're rated for 150 degrees C. So if you're looking at the thermal camera, you, you're, you see the top temperature, you, don't, you want to give yourself some headroom, you don't go much higher than that. So part of my ongoing work is continuing to improve the, the thermal performance of this board as much as the electrical performance. So when we look at the thermal management, uh, this particular design uses bottom side cooled GANs. Uh, so typically when you look at a lot of these previous designs, uh, this is an example here on your right, uh, this is a top side cool design, meaning the GANs are on the top. The way you take the heat off of them is you put a heat sink right on top of the GANs. Uh, and this has proven a challenge for us in the past. One of the issues is you're putting a relatively large heat sink right on top of your GAN switches, and you're trying to get good thermal contact, so you're putting a little bit of pressure on there. But sometimes the GAN switches aren't perfectly level. Sometimes your heat sink or your material might not be perfectly level. So we've had failures in the past where we've put too much pressure or, or, or torqued our switches down and you can actually damage the switches uh, during operation. So a bottom side cooled solution basically is shown here. In this case, you have the GAN device. It's got a big uh, heat slug on the bottom. You put a, uh, several thermal vias uh, through the PCB and then you put the heat sink on the bottom of the board. So you're no longer having to do the interface right on top of the switch, you're doing it on the bottom of the PCB. You have a much flatter surface, you don't have to worry about how level you soldered the GANs, uh, and you have a nice thermal interface. But even this has some room for error in it, especially when it comes to design. So when we look at the, the single-sided design, it's literally everything is on the top side. So if we go back one slide, in this case, all of these are the flying capacitors. They're on the bottom side along with the inductance. Now we have everything on the top side. Input output capacitors, flying capacitors, and the inductors are all on the top side. Nothing on the bottom side. And we have a nice flat surface to mount our heat sink. 
So let's look at some initial results. Uh, this is from the first revision of the board that I've been showing here in black. Uh, and this is 500 volts down to 85 volts. So again, that same six to one step down. Uh, Efficiency is pretty good and about 500 watts. But we can see the GANs. Again, you can use this as reference. Each one of these is the GAN on the board. So the hot spots here are the gallium nitride switches. Uh, and the peak one is up at about 76 degrees Celsius. So this is tolerable, um, but at the same time, not necessarily great once we start scaling up to voltage. As I mentioned before, I start running into thermal limitations when I try to pump more power through this device. This on the right is my second revision. Uh, efficiency is not much different, but the cooling was greatly improved. Uh, and to the point where you can barely see the GANs in the device, this is using the same scale. So each one of the GANs is, at a, is now at a peak of about 52 degrees Celsius. So you can see we went from about 76 degrees Celsius peak down to 52, about a 20 degree uh, improvement. And the improvement is really all just in how we did the heat sinking. Uh, not changing the heat sinking, but the thermal path. So previously, if we look at the bottom side of this board, you can see each one of these is the GAN device. And I didn't do a great job of providing a good thermal path. The thermal vias are there. In fact, the, th the thermal vias between these two designs are exactly the same. But there's not a good interface for the heat sink to actually take the heat out of the board. So you can imagine in this case, uh, in this diagram, there's this bottom copper layer that interfaces to, to your thermal interface material. That wasn't a good connection. It had very high thermal impedance. On the second one, we did a much better job of increasing those pads. So you can see this is actually just the full copper pad here. You get a nice connection to your heat sink. And this alone uh, allowed me to drop that temperature down by about 20 degrees, 20 degrees C under the same circumstances. So when you're doing these designs, these bottom side cool designs, making sure you're paying attention to that thermal path is, is pretty important. And it really allows you to focus uh, to get the best out of your heat sink and the best out of your GAN devices. So conclusion, uh, I showed a four level flying capacitor multi-level converter for 1000 volt applications. Uh, we talked about how this fits into currently high, hybrid electric vehicles, but long term as something we're looking for solar applications. <clears throat> Operation looked good. We had balancing. We showed it in bi-directional mode, both going step up and step down. Uh, so it fits the, the need there. Efficiency is good at this point, but still needs some improvement. And again, some of that we'll be able to push out when we go to higher voltages and really utilize these devices. And then finally, we showed a little bit about the thermals and talked about how making sure you have that very low thermal impedance to your heat sink, uh, and you've really uh, look, considered the bottom side design and how you're getting the heat off the GANs, uh, how it can really improve your work. Uh, quick acknowledgment that this work was funded by uh, CRRC, the China Railroad Corporation. Uh, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Sure. So what strategy did you use to balance the So at this point, we're not doing any active balancing. We're relying on the passive, uh, the, the natural balancing of the converter itself. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to uh, the design. When you're, you want to make sure that you're, you're keeping your commutation loops low to make sure your parasitics are low. Uh, and then the control strategy is basically make sure the duty cycle of each one of these switches is equal um, when you're converting through. Uh, there are cases where you'll, you have to be very careful on how you design your rise times and false times. Because if your rise time, say, is too low, either on your switching node or on your gate driver, you, you have some tolerance there, uh, and you can get timing issues. And timing issues are really what kill the natural balance. If, you, if you're consistently switching one, for, uh, one switch for a longer period than the others, you're inducing a, an error on that. So for this one, basically, it, it was making sure to have the RCs uh, tightly tuned, making sure that the control is putting the same duty cycle to all of them, and then optimizing the layout so that we keep a lot of the, the commutation loops low. Yes. Walk us through a little bit how you would begin to optimize the uh, count for the number of levels. Yeah, so there's a few different approaches you can take. Um, from the high level standpoint, you are looking at 
a few different things. Uh, one is the, the switch rating is an easy place to start. Uh, if, if you know you what your input voltage spec is, uh, you can take it and divide down by however many levels you think is your, your set that you might want to look through, and then find which switches fit into that set. Uh, and then from a high level, some of the work we've done is a little bit more along lines of a um, Monte Carlo analysis where we will match multiple transistors up with multiple levels and multiple switching frequencies and kind of sweep through our design space. Uh, now we pick a certain set of GANs devices uh, and then pick a certain set of levels. So we, we limit ourselves to a certain extent. Uh, and at the same time, we, we have to take into account the, the inductor and some of the losses that you start going there. I don't think at this point we have what I would call a closed form solution of if this is your specs, here's the number of levels. Uh, I think the gate, or sorry, the switch rating drives a lot of it. And you naturally, you know, when you have switches that are at 200 volts or 650 volts, that points you to a certain number of levels. And then it's a matter of trying to find the rest of the components that optimize to that and comparing between the two. All right, thank you very much.